Okay, thanks. Hopefully you're not all falling asleep, dying to get home. I'm trying to keep it lively in the last uh, period of time. So I want to give you a bit of an overview today of Verizon Discovery. Before I get in, into the detail of that, I want to give you a bit of background. So we're an international life science company. So we have 220 employees and they're located on site. It's uh, headquarters in Cambridge, UK, which is where the company was founded. But now we have a lot of staff in Boston, Massachusetts, St. Louis, Missouri, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and Vienna in, in Austria. The company started from very humble beginnings. We started the business with a £25,000 loan at the end of 2007, and our seed investment happened in March 2008, 150,000 uh, angels, University of Cambridge, uh, and myself. And from that day to six years and one day later, we IPO'd on the stock market with the large debt of life science raised from the Cambridge cluster and the largest on, on AIM. So I'll give you a bit of details on that. Pre-IPO, the company had around £20 million of funding, of which 12 million was from individuals, from angels, uh, and the rest from institutions, from venture capitalists. As of the IPO, the, the company had returned 46 million back to those investors, and they're sitting on another 60 million in the company. So depending on what stage you came into the company, you've made between a 2x return and 40x return, and those that are holding still, obviously, we hope to sort of have a multiplier effect on that 40x. So when we went out to IPO, we went out to raise £25 million. And we saw 62 different meetings during a two-week period. We got 61 investors, uh, blue-chip institutions, specialists in life science, a lot of generalists, a lot of private, private client brokers, etc. came into that uh, IPO. And uh, the price, 140 to 170 was the range. We got £192 million of orders. When we pushed the range up to 180, which is what we eventually closed at, that went to 162. And that enabled us to pull in 69 million of new money into the, into the company. We've performed very strongly since then. We just issued our pre-close statement. So we've continued our stellar growth rate in revenue. So our revenue growth rate compound over seven years has been just shy of 120%. And revenue growth this last year over 2013 was 77% at 11.8 million. So we had strong performance. Share price has outperformed all the major indices. Uh, we're at 220 roughly right now. Um, so if you'd have got in at the IPO or in when we had a bit of a tail off after the IPO with a bit of a share overhang, you'd have done extremely well. If you'd have followed Shares Magazine or Investors Chronicle, you'd have made extremely good returns on Horizon to date. So I want to get into the, the company now. So Horizon, very similar to some of the speakers before, we have an interesting life science model. We don't develop drugs. We are a products and services business. That's a bread and butter. Our services are run for profit already. Our products we're investing for scale. because We're trying to sell these picks and shovels now to hundreds of thousands of customers versus the thousands that we have historically. And because our picks and shovels are so good, we actually get a share of the gold without actually investing any money into finding the gold. And so we call it the bread, butter, and jam on top model, call it the cash and carry, call it what you like. Uh, but uh, it's a very different model. And for those of you who are not familiar with biotech, uh, no, broadly as a, as a sector, the types of companies that are coming to market now are very different from what they were 20 plus years ago. I remember going around on the IPO, people were still talking about British biotech, etc. These types of companies are very different. It's about early revenue generation, it's about risk mitigation, it's about capturing that big value you can get there, but driving revenues and profits as well. So our mission is to become a fully integrated company. What does that mean? That means we sell a product, a service, or where intellectual property is strong, we can sell that or research that's performed with it, and we can sell it to customers at every stage of the human healthcare continuum. So from people doing DNA sequencing experiments, through drug discovery, development, drug manufacture, and the diagnostic test at the end that determines which patient gets which drug, we sell a product, service, or we put research programs into those customers' hands. So what is the opportunity behind the business? There are two key drivers to this business. So you'll be familiar in 2001 when Tony Blair and Bill Clinton stood on the steps of number 10 and announced that the Human Genome Project had been completed. $2.6 billion of research over a 10-year period to sequence 90-odd percent of one single person's genome. You've been forgiven if you read the newspapers a few days later that it was only going to be a matter of time. We're all, we're all popping down to boots and getting our genome sequenced and popping pills out of our computers that are going to treat us personally within five years. Well, the reality is it was a huge research effort needed after that. 
Genome sequencing costs have dramatically declined. It's now under a thousand dollars sequence a genome. You sequence a region of a genome, it's, it's pennies, dollars. So anyone can sequence any genome. The problem with the genome project, that was one person's genome at one point in time, at one fixed state of health. There are seven billion people on the planet in constantly evolving states of time and health. And the genetic variation between the disease state and the normal state, these are minute changes, think of them as ones and zeros in computer code. One single change in a one or zero can determine whether you or your kids get cystic fibrosis. They can determine whether you've got a disease, what your prognosis is once you've got it, and even now, will you respond to a drug that the pharmaceutical company has spent 15 years developing. So that small genetic variations determine everything. So the emphasis now is, what does all this data mean? You can sequence a disease in a normal genome and come up with thousands of differences. You now need to be able to, to determine what that is. So that's what Horizon comes in. We're experts at a technology called gene editing. Think of it like a surgeon's toolkit. We're able to take a normal cell, a normal animal, and some people are even taking humans themselves, and we're able to go into those three billion ones and naughts and correct the one that's wrong. And we've been able to, to create a model of disease in a test tube or in an animal, or there are increasingly people now doing this directly in clinical trials to correct diseases at source. So that's the area of translational genomics. How do you turn that data into something that's meaningful to human health? The second is the near bankrupting of the global economy with the cost of healthcare over the next 10, 20, 30 years. The cost of developing drugs is no longer sustainable. If you think of the historical performance, 15 years to develop a drug, three to $11 billion to bring an approved drug to market, not the research cost, the global marketed pharmaceutical cost. Only 30 to 50% of patients respond to drugs. In diseases like cancer, that can be up to 90% of patients do not respond to those drugs. You spend all that money developing. So what happens? We have to charge more for the drug, so the costs are escalating. The drugs only work for a small number of people, so you're paying you, John Q, taxpayer, the reimburser. Everyone's paying for all the failure. That's not a sustainable model. The new model and everything that Horizon does, all these products, services, and research, is about turning that model on its head to a different type of model where you develop drugs to just the genetic drivers that might only represent 5% of patients, 10% of patients, 20% of patients. And I'll give you an example. A Pfizer drug called Crizotinib, or Zel oh, it's not Zelbra, sorry, Crizotinib. And this drug only targets 5% of patients who have a particular genetic feature. It's a rearrangement of those ones and noughts into a different, a different order. And that drug, they identified very quickly from sequencing, it was only going to work in those 5% of patients. So they didn't take 15 years to develop the drug. They took seven years from start to finish. They didn't spend three to 11 billion. They spent less than 500 million. And then they got the drug on the market in 2011. The patents don't expire to 2026. So whilst they're only making 230, 240 million of revenue, they've now got 15 years of patent protection to get a massive return on their investment. Whereas the historical model, by the time you've spent billions, 15 years, you may only have five, six years left before you lose 50% of your revenues with the patent cliff. So Horizon is about picks, shovels, research, to this area called, which President Obama calls precision medicine, where you're developing drugs that are specifically targeted to those genetic drivers of disease. So this is our strategy. That's the sequence continuum. So researchers doing DNA sequencing, coming up with all these genetic changes. We supply reagents to make sure that genetic change that they're measuring is accurately caught, so you're not building the whole process on something that's erroneous. They then want to determine a model, because they need to prove this genetic variation means something in a human. So we can edit and create these patients in a chest tube, the disease and normal situation. They can then test compounds and see how that works. It can then has to go into an animal, so again you've got the genetically defined animal, so not where you're grafting the genetics of the, onto a mouse, you're actually creating the animal from the round up and it has just the genetic change of interest. We perform services on those and charge people for that. Once you've got a drug, we can engineer the cell lines that are the manufacturing engines for drugs. Drugs are manufactured, the biologicals in cell lines, so we can make them better manufacturing engines and people pay us to do that. And once you've got this drug that works in 5% of patients, you want to try and see if there are other patients that might be able to treat that drug. So we have this platform they call the Combinatorics platform, where we can now take that drug that hits those 5% of patients and look at it against thousands of different genetically defined cell lines, which may represent 
hundreds of millions of different patients, so we can identify other patient populations that they might respond to this drug. And then right at the end, coming back to the, almost the beginning, that genetic feature that you started back here with, you're now finding that genetic feature in patients who have diseases, and then you're giving that drug to that patient. We supply the reagents that control and make sure that diagnostic test is performed accurately. Big markets, multiple markets, 29 billion are the macro markets, growing very significant double-digit growth. From the ground up, I estimate our markets to be around 800 million. So our revenue forecasted for this year by the analysts of 20 million, we're about two and a half percent of that market uh, by the end of this year, 2015. These are what the products look like. Cell lines down the middle, these are things that grow. We make cell lines for people. This is how good the technology is. When people pay us to make these models, we own them. So every time one of these gets made, by, you know, paid for by a customer, it goes into our product inventory. And then we can derivatize it, functionalize it, create 14,000 products now. We now have a high throughput engine. We've gone from 2,700 products last year to 14,000 this year. And we can add tens of thousands of new products every year. And we're selling these at all stages of that drug discovery development continuum. This is the jam bit. Think of it as a funnel. It's about creating some shops on goal at the top. Services that are 70% margin. When we're doing an application like these manufacturing cell lines where you're making them produce the drug better, we're able to have a milestone attached to that. So not only do we make a 70% margin on that service, we can get millions of dollars of milestones as they take that cell line in-house, develop it to GMP standards, and then when they develop a drug for it, every drug they put for it, we get a million dollars. And that's a 100% profit margin. The only product is an invoice that goes out to them and we make profit on the service. Or we can elect to eat in a little bit to margin if we like, because we're very high margin services. So we can say to a company like AstraZeneca, you pay for all the research, and because there's a perceived high value, we actually make a bit of profit on that, and then we can get $88 million in milestones for them doing the work. And again, it's just an invoice that goes out when those milestones come in. So we're not investing at all in that activity. Customer growth last year, 2013, 350 customers, just under 1,000 customers in 2014. We're working with 31 of the top 50 market cap pharma companies, plus most of the biotechs, and increasingly lots of academics. We've made a number of acquisitions. One of them is very transforming to us, Haplogen Genomics uh, from Austria. The, our ability to make these models used to be around 100 to 150 a year, and it would cost $10,000 to make them. We can now make several hundred a month, and it only cost us $500 to make them. So it's transformational in terms of our throughput and manufacturing capacity. So we can now address that bottom of the pyramid. So some of you have invested in Abcam, a big shareholder. A friend of mine, Jonathan Milner, founded a company called Abcam that sells antibodies, 1.6 billion market cap, a couple hundred million of revenue. So we're now targeting that market in combination with antibodies and separate with selling the pits and shovels and into those 100,000 plus academic research labs. So that's where a lot of the growth will come from. Quick snapshot, that's the historical revenue growth. So we announced our pre-close, 7% ahead of analyst expectations, and this is forecasting 20 million this year. So another big 7% growth you forecast for 2015. All the key metrics are up. We are an export-driven company. We always have been. 90% of our revenue are exports. Another 70% increase in export growth this year. You heard about the IPO. Start of 2014, our market cap was 45 million. At the end of the year, it was 155 million. It's just shy of 180 million right now. After an initial share overhang with a, a VC who wouldn't lock up at the IPO, so we had a sort of downward pressure on the share price immediately following the IPO. Once we cleared that out, Got back to our 180p a share. There's the performance since that in the last six months of last year, and it's continued to rise after that. And they're all the major indices the NASDAQ, the FTSE, and the AIM market, which significantly outperformed those markets. Quite a lot of peer recognition, European Meta Science Awards for the emerging star of the European public market life science companies, and East of England region, which includes the Cambridge cluster, the biomedtech company of the year. I will spend a bit of time on this. Because I, I invested in 20, 30 companies over the last two years, and I increasingly pick management teams. Good technology in the hand of management teams invariably performs better than great technology in the hands of people who can't manage their companies. This is a team that has been there and done that and bought the t-shirt. 
the executives and non-executives here have started to grow and exit companies with a punitive market cap in excess of $20 billion. And I'll give you a few examples here. So my CFO, Richard Belcott, was leading finance Cambridge Silicon Radio. He won a billion pound P&L, integrated Zoran, a billion dollar acquisition from NASDAQ, and obviously that business exited pretty recently. Eric Rhodes actually listed the first gene editing company on NASDAQ with Bill Gregory uh, called Sangamo Bioscience, well over a billion in terms of market cap. David Smaller exited a number of companies to Insight Genomics, to Merck Serono, and then he was CSO and president of research biotech at Sigma Aldrich on the board there and the director there, and they recently sold to Merck KGA for a rather large sum, around 17 billion in terms of value. He's now chief business officer. And non-execs, you'll probably know some of them. Ian Gillam, chair of a number of different companies. You might be familiar with Axis Shield when he was CEO there. Jonathan Milner, founder of one of the best performing companies on Agcam over the last decade. Susan Gelbraith is the global head of oncology at AstraZeneca and senior vice president of drug discovery. So she actually runs the oncology franchise at AstraZeneca. Susan Searle started Imperial College Innovations and took that, took that public. She's on the board of Kineti. Benchmark Holdings, and various other companies. Uh, my background, having left school at 16 to try and uh, participate in a career of professional football, ended up going into education in my 20s, going to Cambridge to do a PhD in biotech. I've set up four <coughs> companies over the last 10 years. There are around six ongoing right now, so I'm a parallel entrepreneur, been with Horizon since the beginning. Uh, and so you need to know what you get when you bring you back me. But, <laughs> but a few people I obviously recognised it because I was named this year as the Farmer and Biotech Executive of the Year globally and UK Entrepreneur of the Year for companies outside the FTSE 350. So we've got a track record of returning money to investors. So if you don't understand everything I've said today, you will make money. <laughs> so, so here's the, the growth trajectory. This is what the analysts are saying for, for this year and the year after that. It's key value drivers, scalable services. We're interested in high margin, content driven, not commodity services. Premium products, that's where a lot of the investment is going into the business to attack this broad academic market so you can get that AppCam like predictable revenue stream. And a very targeted amount of effort in leveraging our IP and margin to generate what we have now, which is 158 million pounds of potential milestones and product royalties, but with no cost to bear on those programs. So we do a little bit more of that on top. These are the future objectives. It's all about driving value. We've just hired the former e-commerce director of Abcam, so we're building that sort of system up so we can target that academic base, linking that value chain. The benefit of being fully integrated is you can link all of those steps and get much closer to the value chain of the pharmaceutical company or the diagnostic company, so you can get better deals, <coughs> bigger deals. We now have this high-tech manu high throughput manufacturing, so we can make vast amounts of products very quickly and cheaply. I'd like to increase the PL depth in some of those key areas, particularly in the products areas. So our acquisition strategy, we very much target a significant acquisition to add more revenue and depth to that, and expand the offering across the personalized medicine value chain. So why else should you invest in this business? The first investor in this business, Dr. Geraldine Rogers, I've known for 20 years. They backed this company where none of the technology in Horizon even comes from the UK, let alone Cambridge. It's all American technology, a $50 million of NIH funding, and we brought it all to the UK with the IP suite, and they've been expect exporting products and services since. Well, Geraldine Rogers died of lung cancer three weeks ago, our first investor. And the reason I put this slide up is to talk about our future vision and what we're doing to change patients' lives in cancer. Geraldine's future was decided 10 years ago when those drugs were developed. <coughs> That's how long it takes to develop drugs. These drugs don't help people who are living now. You know, new drugs, the new drug development doesn't help people who are living now, until now. And Horizon's technology platforms are very much at the center of this. So Horizon has around nine big academic consortia grants. Uh, these are around $10 million grants, $3 million grants, $5 million grants. And this particular one we're extremely proud of called the Cold Threads Consortium. So in this case, we've got 400 patients who are in Torino. With colon cancer, they'd be given targeted therapy called Herbitux, and they will become resistant to that drug after around two years. And in four years, they'll relapse and die. But they have four years between that time. Before those drugs, they may have had 12, 18 months. So they've got four years. 
So how do we help them? Well, what we do is we deep sequence those patients. So you're creating these mountains and molehills of genetic features, thinking like buckets, and you're identifying which patients will become resistant. Then you're doing other studies to identify why they're becoming resistant. And then we can rapidly, once we know that, create these patients in a test tube that represent those genetic features. And you can start doing combination tests. So there'll be drugs that may tackle the resistant mechanism. So you do combination trials in a test tube. We can then create the animals that are, again, represent the genetic features of the disease, the normal, the resistant mechanism, and the normal. And so we can rapidly get to a position where we know whether a combination is going to work. So this loop is around 24 to 36 months. And we're now driving four clinical trials on these patients. What you have is now effectively avatars of those patients. So there's a patient in a bed, and there's a mouse with the genetics of the patient in a bed in the clinic. And you're going straight back into the clinic. These are now being approved as phase one clinical trials. And you're now able to rapidly take that combination back into the patient whilst they're still living. So actually helping patients while they're still living. All this drug development we talk about will help patients 10, 12 years down the line. But this technology-enabled solution called adaptive trials has real hope for cancer patients who are actually living now. A few tips in the media. So we've been tipped by quite a lot of people. Many people in shares made quite a decent, decent amount, probably not as much as Investors Chronicle, uh, but people who got in over the IPO made a particularly good amount of money. So there's quite a lot of stuff out there for you to read and review. And if you can't find it, just get in touch with us and we'll make sure we'll point you in the direction of all the stuff that's available for you to review. Actually, a really nice piece by the small company share watch, a two, three page piece that's actually one of the best pieces I've seen written outside of you know, analysts uh, in the marketplace. So just finishing, why should you invest in us? One, we've always made people money. That's first and foremost why you want to invest. So we will make you money. Second is, you probably want to do something more than just make money. This is something that is extremely worthy. It's having an impact on patients' lives now. And again, another sort of two, three, four years of this, you're going to start getting much faster approval times for drugs, much better iterative feedback loops so you can help patients. If you improve our technology so that we can do this loop in 12, 18 months, you can start helping patients with the more aggressive cancers like lung cancer, pancreatic cancer. So make money and also do some good. Any questions? Dan, could you say a few words about the competitive landscape? Yes, absolutely. So, in terms of the, um, so you have to think of it in two different areas. So, in terms of the platform technologies in genome editing, I think we are the strongest player in the world by some significant margin in genome editing. We're pretty much one of the pioneers in, in this space. We've acquired our biggest competitor. We have a unique position in our RAAV technology, which is the most precise genome editing technology. It's actually approved for clinical therapy. It's the only gene editing therapy where it's treating patients as a approved drug. There are 120 clinical trials on there with it. So it's ultimately precise. And we have worldwide exclusive position. No one's operating in that space. We've increasingly acquired all of the additional technologies. So that's the scalpel, the scissors, if you like, which are a little bit quicker but a lot dirtier, customers don't care. They just have their solution. And this is, so we acquire all those technologies in, we acquire the company in, we have a very strong position in those areas as well. So we have the most comprehensive genome editing platform. There's really only one big player who has a slither of genome editing, but they're not doing what we do with it. They're selling a few reagents here and there as part of a huge rate portfolio of things they do. The Thermo Fisher is a quite billion plus company. They sell hundreds of thousands of different things, and it's a I need a piece of their portfolio that they're selling a few reagents into academia and pharma, so it's not a focus for us. On the drug discovery side, I would agree what John said, we have peer-to-peer -peer competitors, people doing things that you're doing in different ways with older, inferior technologies, but they're still more, they can be more cost-effective. We're a very premium kind of product. But in terms of enablement of this personalized medicine paradigm, we are, I don't think we're expecting to appear us in that. Can you say something about your shareholder base? And are you also listed in the States? No, so we're not listed in the States. So if you're familiar, we took in 12 million of uh, angel funding, so that comes to the EIS. Yeah, so we have to unwind that EIS at the A, into the A market if you can retain that EIS status. I want to build a UK company that dominates.
its, its sector. Right? We have acquired two US companies, we've acquired the, the Vienna company, and we've redomiciled their tax status and patent box, etc. etc. So our investor base is very much uh, a mixture right now. So we've got 62 investors from the, from the IPO. So you've got very big institutions, so you've got in, Investo, Leading General, Henderson Global, Henderson Volante, all the big institutional funds from there, and private client wealth funds like Killick and various others that, that go down that, down that list. Uh, we've increasingly now added retail, so I think we're about 7% of our shares are, are retail. We have a 70% free float, so there's good liquidity in the shares. And we have around 12% of new US investors who have invested from the US in there. And it's part of my strategy to get US investors, but to bring the investing into the UK rather than listing in the States. I just had a, a quick question. Um, you mentioned that you're also an entrepreneur, you have a number of different companies that you're running or, or have a hand in. Um, and your personal ambition, you said you want to grow a billion pound company. Do you see yourself being at the helm of that? Or do you, Absolutely. yeah? Yep. And at the same time you can manage or, or have these other interests? Or do you think Absolutely. you have to scale well, some back? You are someone who's busy, don't ask <laughs> And just one, one, one further to that, um, and we've had a number of companies this evening who are broadly in the medical, healthcare, bio arena. A number have floated relatively recently as well. Now, do, do, do you think this is um, investor appetite has led this, or that there's a number of entrepreneurs who are pushing companies through? How, how has this come, come together all of a sudden? Both, both the companies, both of our excellent companies, and people who are ambitious about building their companies. You know, I think that's, that's something that has changed over the years. There's been maturation in the market. People have gone through this first wave of venture-backed companies, and in life sciences, they haven't made much money, to be quite frank. There's uh, other people who've made lots of money, but not the, uh, the founders and the So they've found new models. You know, Horizon was like, we were profitable for our first three trading periods as a biotech. Like, we, invest, we chose to invest when we didn't need to raise, when we had to raise money when we didn't need it. That's how we got ahead of the game. I can tell you that people made 40, 60 X returns are the early shareholders. The VCs made two to four X in proportion to their risk appetite, and I think that's a fair outcome. Normally, they invert that process, so they make all the returns, and the, the early founders and shareholders don't make any money. So I think that's changed. These types of entrepreneurs you've seen tonight are doing things differently. And I think people like um, Neil Woodford, I think, had a great impact. Why does he, he doesn't know a lot about biotech. He just knows as a sector, it's a massively undervalued asset class. If you go back to the first wave of biotech investments in the States between 84 and 2000, over 50 billion went into that. The top five companies alone, including Genentech, Amgen, Biogen, et cetera, returned 110 billion of capital. And then there's thousands of other companies that made money. But if you went into that trying to pick the one winner, the British biotech of this company, you were left kissing the bad frog. You'll still be sitting there in the city like some people are moaning about British biotech 20 years ago, but what Whitford does, two things, invest very broad across in the sector, the biggest market, forget the internet of things, it's trillions of dollars, healthcare, and no one's going to, you know, it's going to just keep growing and growing and growing, so you need to invest broad in that market, and the second thing I think that he does very, very well is he backs management teams as well, so he finds ambitious entrepreneurs and backs those ambitious entrepreneurs. And the final thing was, and so Cassidy is a fantastic example of this, the biggest life science IPO last year, it was not Verizon, it was not an American company, it was another British company called Circassia that raised $330 million. The fact it raised $330 million was not a success. It was that Susan Searle on our board persuaded Neil Woodford and Pete Davis at Lansdowne to back Imperial Innovation. They were able to get £30 million pre-IPO into Circassia as a biotech. And then when it raised all of that money, it doesn't need to partner with pharmaceutical companies to give the value away. It keeps all that value, has enough money to go to market with its drugs, and if it makes it, they will keep all the billions and billions of revenue, and then they can be a Genentech or an Amgen and start consolidating the industry. The historical lack of ambition, I don't think it's the founders, I think often it's a lack of ambition of the investors who invest in life science companies. That one trick pony, $100 million IPO, there's only one place for it to go, is to be sold to an American Usually, I'm one more question. Have got a question? When I've looked at some of these companies, like um, Imperial Innovations, I couldn't understand why the PE ratio is in 61. I don't, I don't understand those numbers. What? You don't need to understand it. You need to understand what did I pay for the share? What did I get when I sold it? <laughs> <laughs> 
I've never done that. If you want it, I mean, I'm sure we all say the same thing. If you want dividends, don't buy our shares. Right? 2017-18, the EFF strategy will be paying dividends and a bit, but we are a growth capital stock. Right now, once we transition to profit in 17, then you can start getting dividends. <laughs> Thank you.